How many of you smelt an aroma when you came in the building this morning? You smell bacon? You walk in this morning, you're like, are they serving biscuits this morning? Uh, yesterday we had the uh, opportunity to come together in a, in a men's prayer or men's breakfast and had a probably, I had a hard time counting because people kept going back up for seconds. And uh, I think we had 70, 75 guys here, which was phenomenal. Uh, it was great. It was a lot of fun. You know, one of the mo- most amazing things, I'm, I'm sitting here this morning with you and I'm worshiping with you and, and uh, you feel the presence of God, you feel the aroma of God, you smell the aroma of God and started thinking about that, that bacon and it's a great example of not necessarily the aroma of God, but it's, 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 it's mindful of just how when we get in his presence, that aroma is there. You know, and when we leave a place, it should always be our hope that when we leave a place of worship, that when we leave it, we leave it with the aroma of the worship of God. You know, and I think it's so important that we realize that we're not perfect. I don't know if that's news to anybody in here yet or not, but you're not. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. But we know the perfect person. And he's in charge and he's leading it. Um, Is there such thing as a perfect church? No, it's impossible because it's full of imperfect people, right? I mean, when you put a bunch of human beings that have flesh on them into a building, it's messed up. So if you've come here knowing that you're messed up, you're in the right spot. But God is here today to do something different. I was so excited a couple of weeks ago when Pastor Jason said, hey, I want you to speak on this coming Sunday. Um, I'm going to be out. And I was excited about it until I looked at the material. And I'm like, that kind of hurt me a little bit. I'm not sure if I want to share that. I don't know if, if you've ever had that opportunity or not. You're like, oh, I want to speak to it, but do I have to speak about that? Um, because in this, in this series, when we get to, we're, t- we're going to talk about the church of Ephesus today. And when you get to that church, it, it, for, at least for me, it hit home. Um, so, of course, a church is not perfect. It can't be perfect because it's made of an imperfect and, and sinful people. And it makes me think about a guy that was... He was lost. You've probably heard this story before, but I'm going to tell it again anyway. Um, there, there was a guy that was lost on a deserted island. He'd been there. It was a plane wreck. Um, you know, there was several people supposed to be, they didn't think there was, this was years later, and they didn't think there were any survivors, and there was a search plane going over top this island. And all of a sudden, they saw this smoke, probably bacon cooking, and, and they probably smelt that, and they thought, hey, there's something going on down there. And they looked down, and there's these huts. There's, there's one, two, three, four huts there. And they're like, well, man, there's got to be somebody there. So it's a seaplane, you know, and they land, and they land, they go up to the guy, and, and he's excited, and they're excited. And he says, hey, we're here to get you guys off the island. So grab your stuff, grab the other people, and let's go. So he grabbed what little bit he had, which wasn't much, and he went towards those, those people, and they're like, well, where's everybody else at? And he said, no, I'm, I'm it. And what do you mean, what do you mean you're mean, you it? Well, I'm, I'm the only one that's on this island. There might be some on another island, but I'm the only one that's been here. And they're like, well, what's with the, what's with the four buildings? And he's like, well, that's where, some of you are going, yeah, I've heard this. That the first building is where I live. And they're like, okay, well, what's the second building? Well, that's where I eat. All right, well, what's the third building? That's where I go to church. They're like, well, what's the fourth one? That's where I used to go to church. (laughs) Now, for some of you, you laugh, so you're like, I hadn't heard that before. But isn't that how silly we can be about church? And when it really comes down to the worship of Jesus Christ, a building has nothing to do with it. It's not about a building. It's not about denomination. It's about our heart reaching out to him. And that's what it's about. Worship is, is so powerful because it's that personal, intimate relationship that we have with him. Jesus had something to say to the seven distinct churches of Asia Minor. Almost 2,000 years ago, as he relayed his message to the Apostle John, with each of these seven churches, Jesus had something to communicate, and they all needed a remedy. That remedy was and still is today, Jesus. And so many times we find ourselves trying to do things on our own. And we can do things for a little while by ourselves and then we hit walls. And then we don't know what the next step is. But he's always the next step. So today, as I've already said, we turn our attention to the church of Ephesus. 
Ephesus was a major port city on the western coast of Asia Minor. Center for seaborne uh, trade in the hub of the region's road system. It was a thriving urban community of more than 250 to 300,000 people, very similar to the population size of Las Vegas. As a city known for its religious shrines, a spacious, uh, spacious theater, stadium, and elegant public buildings. In Revelations 2 through 2 and 3, we're going to find what God was pleased about in this church. Because one thing you'll see through this uh, series is we see what God is pleased with and then we see what God is not pleased with. Starting in verse 2, it says, I know your works. Does that ever, does that ever make you just stop and shudder for a moment? I know your works. Okay, I, I know what you're telling people you're doing, but I really know what you're doing. I know about the t-shirt you wear. I know about the the bumper sticker on your car, but I know what's really going on in your life. And you know what? He still loves us. He still cares for us. He's trying to bring us out of that miry muck. And in this situation, he's like, I know your works, I know your labor, I know your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And you have preserved and have had patience. And you have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. I mean, that sounds great, doesn't it? They were a very hardworking, busy, ministering church. You could nickname this church the Church of St. Martha. Lots of busy work. But a busy church doesn't always mean a spiritual church. Amen? We can get caught up in a lot of stuff. You know, like yesterday, um, if, if I had a lot of help. And by the way, this, this morning, if you're in this room and you helped yesterday or even showed up to be part of breakfast, thank you. Would not have been successful without you. But in that moment, when we do things like that, or even when we come to church, we, we, we have these boxes that we check off and we have all this stuff that we think we need to accomplish. And, and, and if we don't watch it, we fly right past it, right past the whole service and just miss the opportunity to have that intimacy with God. That's the only reason you're here. Okay, I thought I'd at least have one or two amens on that, but that's okay. I'll go back to it in a minute. One of you said it over there, but it's too late. Uh, we'll, try it. we'll try it again in a minute. Their doctrine. The church at Ephesus could not bear those who were evil. They would vet, test, and confirm if someone was true or false according to biblical, uh, biblical truths. And if they were false, the church would have nothing to do with their teaching. So they were very, very busy doing churchy stuff just so they could look like the perfect church. But were they? No. Because again, there's no such thing. So here's the criticism. Revelations 2, 4, and 5. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. Repent. And do the first works, or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That should make us shudder. I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you out. I'm going to take away the anointing I've given you if you do not what? Repent. We've talked about that for weeks, and, and I don't know about you, we don't, that's one thing it seems like a lot of times the church moves away from, but repentedness heart, repenting hearts are so very important because when we, when we give up what God already knows, it gives more room for him to come in. I mean, he, you're not sneaking up on him. He, he already knows exactly what you're hiding. He knows what you're doing. So why was Jesus so upset with their actions? Because it was just that. It was actions. There was no heart. In fact, he had said, I'll say it again, you have lost your first love. 
They had lost the joy of their salvation because of rules and checking the boxes. They had truly become a church of rules. If we truly love Jesus, we must have passion for his kingdom, which should compel us to share his word to all those around us. Now, I don't know if you guys can remember back in elementary school, maybe first grade, you used to go on field trips. Anybody get to go on field trips? Do they still go on field trips? Yes. Hallelujah for field trips, right? How many have been to the Lost Sea? I think we went there four years in a row. It was no longer lost. We had found it at least four times. But today, we're going to get the opportunity to go on a field trip. By the way, if you don't know where the Lost Sea is, it's in Sweetwater, Tennessee. We're going to start off in this, this field trip, a missional field trip in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Now, I will tell you this. Some of this was in the series and some of it is where God just kept expanding. And I prayed for you this morning that it does as much as it has for me. And it probably will even in the moments that I speak it again, that God reminds us of our roles in his church. And again, it's not about this building. It's about the church. So let's look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You've heard it since you were in vacation Bible school. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I command you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, I, I love that scripture, but I also like to break that scripture down because we know it as the Great Commission, but it is a commission, it is a command, it is not a suggestion. But the church itself has decided that it's a suggestion. And when I'm talking about the church, I'm not talking about just Hope Church. I'm talking about all the churches. Because we have gotten comfortable where we are, what, who we think we are, and we we've, we've forgot about whose we are. Think about this. I want to look at a couple of key words in this commission. Going back up to um, the middle of verse 18. Some authority has been given to me. All? Does that mean all of it? All authority? This is Jesus speaking. We know that. But here's the, here, here's the amazing thing that, that gets me sometimes when we start to break, break things down with our relationship with Christ. If I believe in him, the things that he's been doing, not only would I do those things, I'll do greater things. Greater is he that is in me as he that is in the world. Sorry, guys, now those scriptures are on the screen. So, I have that same authority that Jesus has. All authority. Not just some, but all authority. And then notice down verse 19, second word in verse 19. Therefore, stay in your comfy chairs at the church you serve in and hope people come to you. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? Go. So it's a verb. We're supposed to go. Go where the people are. We're going to get into that in a few minutes, but it's important to go where the people are. You mean where the messed up, dirty people are? Yeah, that's where you live. That's where you work. That's who we are. So why in the world would we be afraid to go to them? Because we already live there. It's just sometimes once a week or twice a week, sometimes we actually come to church twice a week, and, and, we, and we get to a building and we think, oh, we've got it all figured out. It's comfortable. We wear something nice and we, we sit in these comfy seats and we, we've got air conditioning and we've got heat. We've got all the things that we need. We've got the aroma of bacon. I mean, this is the place to be. But it's not necessarily where God has called you to be. He's called you to make a difference in the world that you're in. Yeah. We've got some great ministries in this church. Did y'all catch some fish yesterday? Hallelujah, there was fish caught. 
Anybody fish? There's a ministry here, netminders, that gets to share the gospel to fishermen. We have a wonderful children's program. We've got a wonderful youth program. We've got a wonderful seniors program. We've got this group and that group and this group and that group. And I've heard people say, well, I don't really have a group that fits me. Then start one. Yeah. Or you have people come to you and say, well, this is not so much for me this here, but in other churches that I have pastored have come to me and say, well, Mike, you know, I really think God wants you to do this. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I think he wants you to do that. Now, how can I help you do that? And I know that's what support you would get here. The support staff that you've got here. I'm telling you, I, I've never been in a church that's this blessed. Three or four of you agree. Okay. Uh, I've, never, I've never been in a church so blessed. But you know what? Because they're servants. His servant's heart. And it starts, it starts from the, the beginning. I know he'll listen to it at some point. So, Pastor Jason, that's for you. I know it's, but it, seriously, it starts with a wonderful lead pastor. Yeah. It does. We've got that. And it just trickles down from there. It's, it's the opportunity for us to lead, for he leads by example. We fall up under it. So go. We know it's about going. It's a verb. Don't sit and wait. And then, therefore, go and make disciples of some of the nations. Go back to what I've said. You know what? Really? I mean, I've got to go to all of them? Yeah. Even the ones I don't like? Oh, oh, no. You mean there's people in your life that you don't really care for? Is there neighbors in your neighborhood that you don't get along with? Well, it got quiet. Yeah, I can admit it. But you know what? God has told me he loves them as much as he loves me. And it's important that we reach out to them because you know what? You never know what somebody's going through. I work for a hunger relief organization. We work a lot with Convoy Hope. I'm so thankful that they are where they are and they are who they are. But when I, before I went to work for the place that I work for, um, I was serving locally here at a church that was feeding hungry people. And as we were, as we were feeding hungry people, some of the cars that were coming around were nicer than the cars, the car that I had. And it, and it bothered me. And I became very religious and very arrogant. I don't know if that ever happens to you or not, but it did me. And there I was questioning who these people were, what problems they really had, and how they had this nice car. And these other people, and, and I voiced it, whether that was smart or not. I mean, not to those people, but... I voiced it, I'm not that silly. Um, I voiced it to the leadership there and they're like, hey man, you never know where they've come from. Because that's, that's the right answer to come back, right? Because we don't know where people have come from. We don't know what they're facing. So this ministry, when they gave away food, they always, when they were giving away food, they always prayed for people. You know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a great time really to ask somebody, you want, do you want prayer? Because that's a good time, right? Because you're giving them food. They're like, oh, okay, sure. I mean, some of them were like that way. And some of them were like, yes, please pray with me. And it's kind of like the same thing today. I'm fixing to chase a rabbit. It's, it's, it's the same way today. Today, when you go out to eat, I don't know how many of you go out to eat today somewhere. After, I mean, will. Some of you will. Okay, four of you will. Uh, after you do the four of you, when you get there, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me teach you something real quick that blew my mind one time when somebody told me this. This is not original. Uh, when your server comes and asks you, you probably are, maybe some of you have done this. So your server comes and asks you what you want to drink. Hey, sir, what would you like to drink today? I'd like to have sweet tea. Oh, by the way, before you go get my sweet tea, is there anything going on in your life that I could pray with you about? Whew. Now, when you say that, first of all, you've got their attention because they're serving you. But be ready for the outcome. Be ready for the response. Because the first time I ever did that, see, I heard it in a men's conference somewhere one time. And we were heading out for lunch after that. We were, I think we were at a Logan's or something. And I thought, I'm going to be that guy. You know, I'm going to be that guy. I was taught today how to do this, and now I'm going to be that guy. And I did it. I said it. It came out of my mouth. And when it came out of my mouth, I heard it. I was like, why did you say that? And I'm like, well, I was taught to say that today. So I did it. And when I said it and it came out, the lady was like, she started crying. And I did I not say it right? And she sat down, and I didn't even know that was legal. <laughs> she sat right down there next to me. And she, she said, 
you have no idea what this means to me. And I'm learning as we go because they didn't tell us what to do after that point. <laughs> you know, and I, and I, I encouraged her, I said, what's going on? And she said, I've got a baby at home and it's sick. My husband left me. My mom's got cancer. She's all I got. I know what the outside was doing, but the inside was going, okay, I need out of here. Because I didn't have the answer except what? Jesus. That's the only answer I could give her. But you know what? It's the only answer she needed. And we sat there for a few minutes and we, we talked and we prayed. I don't know what happened to her. I wish I had this great end of the story that had this big bow on it that she received Christ that day. I don't know what happened to her. But I know that when I asked her because someone had told me to and I was really, it's kind of like Jonah who we're going to talk about in just a second. Jonah, he was a reluctant servant, was he not? That was kind of like me in the moment. I wanted to look good. I wanted to do what I was supposed to. I had buddies around me and people were watching me. And then all of a sudden I'm right smack dab in the middle of ministry. Some of you need some of that. Some of you just come to church. Uh oh. Some of you just come to church on Sundays and Wednesdays or just Sundays and you walk away and say, all right, check that box for the week. This is not ministry. This is coming to a building. God can do amazing things here and he will do amazing things here. But this is not ministry. Ministry is hard. Ministry is ugly. It's sweaty. And it's never, uh, and rarely is it a whole lot of fun. I'm just trying to be transparent. But you know what? It's what you're called to be. The Great Commission just told you that. Don't be the church of Ephesus. Don't just wear the clothes. Just don't check the boxes. Do ministry. Do you realize in most churches, 20% of the people do all the work? I, I don't know here. We, we do have probably a little more than 20% doing it. But what if 50% was doing it? What if 60? What would Hope Church look like? Radically different. It would look radically different. Well, Mike, I don't know where to serve. Ask somebody. There's all kinds of places to serve. There's great places to serve. Right now, downstairs, right now, there's a whole bunch of little kids running around. I mean, they're crazy. Some of them are your kids. You know they're crazy. But you know what? They're being loved on right now in the name of Jesus. By some great people. But you know those great people, they get wore up because they're down there Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. You get the point, Sunday after Sunday. They need some help. They need some help. Go find Pastor Sherry. Go find Pastor... Uh, I started to say Drew, but he's sitting here. But you, you can say Drew too. I'm sure more more room for help at the 931. <laughs> Go see Pastor Bryant. More help is needed. Go. Well, they haven't asked me. That's not what the scripture says. <laughs> it says, "Go, go find them. What can I do for you? How can I help?" And then once you go, making disciples of all nations. Not just the ones you're comfortable with, but all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to camp there just for a second. Baptizing. For me growing up in a Southern Baptist church a long, long, long time ago, before I really understand just how powerful the Holy Spirit was, I remember the first time I got introduced to the Holy Spirit, I wasn't sure what it was, but I wanted more of it. But being baptized in, in, growing up was being submerged. I didn't know of any other way. I served a little time, I don't mind telling you my background, I served a little time in a Methodist church. I was, I, one thing I've learned about myself is this, I'm not Baptist, I'm not Methodist, I'm a Christian. I will go anywhere he lets me serve. I'm excited about him. I went, I'm not, not to boost him, I went through a spiritual walk one time called the Walk to Emmaus and it absolutely wrecked my life. And it wasn't because of the Walk to Emmaus, it was because of Jesus that was at the Walk to Emmaus. It wrecked me. And where it really wrecked me was when I think about being baptized, being submerged. Now think about this. Being submerged in what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? We're submerged in it. When's the last time you've been submerged in God? I'll wait. <laughs> Have you ever been submerged in God? Probably. Some. But think about being submerged. You know, I used to, I used to poke fun a little bit when I, I got to do baptisms and... and um, 
You know, I'd be like, especially if it was a kid I really thought a lot of, and I'd be like, you know, your mom and dad, they gave an extra $5 in offering for an extra 30 seconds in the water. <laughs> you know, and then I come back, no, I'm just kidding, you know, trying to make them relax because they're just stiff as a board. And they don't know what, I'm like, it's just water. It's not going to hurt you. But, but think about it. If you're afraid of water, have you ever baptized somebody that's afraid of water? It's an adventure. It's like trying to put a cat down there. You know, they're, they're coming out. But you, you, put, you put somebody under water, and if they're afraid of the water or not afraid of the water, what's the one thing they're thinking about while they're in the water? Either, either air or water, right? That's the two things, they're, one of the two they're thinking about. So when is the last time you've been so submerged in God, he's the only thing you thought of? I'll wait. Very few times in my life have I been there. I want more of that. I, I, I want it in swimming pool size. I want it in lake size. I want it in ocean size. I mean, sometimes we just want a little can. We just want, you know, a communion cup. Give me just a little communion cup of Jesus. No, I want it all. Yeah. It's not always going to be fun. It's not always going to be pretty. It's not always going to be comfortable. But it's what he's called us to be. Let's go on our field trip. Still with me? Yeah. All right. Jonah 1. One through three, and somebody's, somebody's going, surely he's not going to read that. No, it's, but it's only four chapters. I mean, I could, but Jonah 1, one through three. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amatti, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying a fare, he went aboard and sailed to Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now think about this. Jonah ran because the people of Nineveh didn't look like him, talk like him, dress like him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He won't fool with them. How many of you are running from what God's called you to do? We've all ran. We've all ran. So don't, don't beat yourself up. But know that God is still calling you. It cost him a lot to run from God. It, asked, it physically cost him money. Where it says he paid a fare. He paid to run from God. Those of you in this room, including me, because there's still times in my life right now that I run from God. It cost me dearly. It cost my family. It cost my church. It cost my friends. It cost everyone. Because when you run from God, you're not a whole lot of fun to be around. Because you're miserable. So some of you right now have been poking the one next to you. I can see you. Say, that's why you're miserable. But I physically went through that. I grew up as a preacher's kid. I didn't want to go into ministry. I'm like, I don't want no part of that. And I made everyone around me miserable until I finally said yes. And I was still reluctant. But what's it costing you to run from God? Somebody in here this morning is in the belly of the fish. How's that working out for you? Think about that. Think about Jonah being in the belly of that fish. Smelly, dark. Everything that that fish has eaten is in there with you. It's uncomfortable. And what does Jonah do? Whole, there's a whole chapter. Lord, I'll do anything if you'll get me out of this belly of this fish. Anything. Some of you have done the same thing. But to get out of the belly of the fish, what had to happen? And I'm not going to say it. But that fish had to, they had, he had to get rid of Jonah, right? I don't know what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say. So. <laughs> but the fish had to get rid of him. So as he came out, I bet that was fun. You know, and some of you, God has delivered you out of the belly of a fish. And you told him whatever he wanted to hear to be delivered. Let's just be real for a minute. Lord, I'll do this, 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 this. I'll teach school. I'll teach Sunday school. I'll drive a bus. I'll be in children's church. I'll do this. I'll do whatever you want me to do. If you'll just deliver me from this situation, if you'll just get me out of the middle of this fish, I will do that. And the moment that he gets you out of it, you completely forgot what you promised him. Mm, that hurts, doesn't it? The word of the Lord came back to Jonah the second time. You know the crazy thing? It was the same word that came the first time. The exact same word. So for you that forgot, just like me and how many times I have forgotten, it's the same word. 
Mike, go back and do what I told you to do. But see, a lot of times what ends up happening to us, you've ever crossed a big river or at least a pretty, <laughs> um, I can't think of what word I'm looking for, right? and a, a stream that really wants to be a river. You know, it's got, it's got a little bit of, it's got a little bit of current to it. And you're trying to get this. There's a much better word for that. That's just all I could get. So you're, you're trying to cross this river because God has called you to go there. Okay. And you're at this river and you're like, I'm going to do it. Cross this river. I go and you start going across the river and you do make it. But instead of going there, you end up way down there because what the current took you that way, right? Because that's what current will do. Do you know what? God expects you to come back to this. That's right. He didn't call you to go there. He called you to go there. So you got to work yourself away. No matter where the world takes you, you got to be willing to go back to where God has called you. And great things will happen. So God called to him. Well, we know God already called to him twice. And well, what's he calling you to? So Mike, are we even called though to, to serve those who have a past? Do you have a past? It's not pretty sometimes, is it? God has called you out of your past, though. You are not who you used to be. We should just sit right there for a minute and celebrate. You are not who you once was. You are changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. But do we still have to minister to those people? Yeah. Let's look at John 4. Two places in John 4. 27 through 30 and then 39 through 41. But before we read the scripture, I want to be, I want you to be reminded that Jesus, a Jew was talking to a Samaritan woman and remember Samaritans and Jews do not get along. Jews thought Samaritans were dogs. They're not worthy. But also be my, be reminded before we get into this, that Jesus disciples were with him when he first came up to the well and he sent his disciples away possibly up to five miles, some scholars think, to get food and bring food back. So five miles there, five miles back. That'll take a little time, won't it? So Jesus had read her mail and it set her free. He said, I know who you are. I know what you've done. I know all the things that you, that you say that you are, but I know who you really are. And if you'll give my, your life to me, I'm going to set you free. And you know what he did? He set her free. Just like that. So just like you this morning, the ones of you that's got a past, you're like, oh my gosh, is he fixing to read my mail and say something about me? No, but the Holy Spirit just did one in your mind. But you know what? He's ready for you to give that up. He wants you to give it up. He don't want you to keep it. This one was, had the audacity to give up her sin. Hallelujah. That's where we should be. So we're going to pick it up in 27. Just then his disciples, so all that's taking place. She's made whole again. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, much less a Samaritan woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. I dare say that if his disciples had been with him, the moment that he met that woman, ministry could have not have taken place. Let that sink in for a minute. They would have gotten caught up into that hate. They don't look like me. They don't smell like me. They don't worship like me. They don't have the same skin color I have. They don't have any of that. So therefore, I can't minister to those people. So Jesus, in his wisdom, sent them away so that he could make things happen. You see, a lot of times, especially at the end of services, you know, we have the opportunity to come and respond. You know, it's such a powerful time for us to send all that stuff away and forget about it and just be focused on Jesus and allow him to change us in that moment and then watch what will happen. So do you think there was an impact beyond? I don't know how much you've paid attention to the story. Maybe that's the end of the story for you. But there is a huge impact if you read just a few more verses into this. Verse 39 through 41. 
Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him. Why? Why did they believe in him? Because of the woman's testimony. Because of what she had experienced. Do you realize that people will believe in Jesus because of what you have went through? But you got to tell them. Mike, I don't want to tell them my junk. I don't want to tell them how, how I was. Why? Are you still that person? No. I hope you're not. We've all been scoundrels. Can we just go ahead and admit that? We've all messed up. But if you're serving him and you love him and you're worshiping him, you can't help but change. And then when people, people, people are not interested in your scriptural knowledge and how much you know between Genesis 1 and Revelation 22. I know that's destroying some of you theologians in here. But they don't care. They want to know how you made it through your trouble. And Jesus is the only way you made it through your trouble. We don't always give him that credit, but it's the truth. So when the Samaritans, verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. What? A Jew staying with Samaritans? That don't happen. Why would that happen? The audacity for them to ask Jesus to stay with them. And not only did he stay, he stayed for two days. He went and had a Jesus party with them. And because of his words, many more became believers. Now think about how that all started. This woman, full of sin, at a well, trying to get water. Jesus shows up, changes everything. Hey, me in here, need we live in water. I promise if you'll drink from that well today, Jesus will change everything. Everything. The whole village was changed because of one meeting. We can't get, church, listen to me. We can't keep getting in Jesus' way. We've got to be willing servants. We've got to be willing. And that means you're going to have to talk to people you don't want to talk to. You're going to have to, you're just going to have to get out of the way. And if you're, and, and, and if you're not there yet, let me, let, me, let me stop just for a minute. If you're not there yet, then at least get out of the way and let somebody else do it. Because you don't want somebody to miss that. We have to grow into that, in, in, into that, bil- that, that ability. You still with me? Yes. Got time for one more? Yes. Okay, two of you, good. All right, thank you, Gary. <laughs> we got to be willing to go. Biggest cheerleader in the room right there. I mean, they've even put him on ESPN too. Right. We've got to be willing to go where the people are. Matthew 14, 13 through 21. I love this story. It's, it's just, it's, it's what my ministry that I work with every day is based on. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. And as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's getting very late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves the food. Why would they do that? You ever thought about that? Why would they do that? Because they were thinking about what they could provide. They were providing what, what they could bring to it. They were looking at, they were, they were so caught up into their circumstances, they forgot who they were with. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're so caught up in the whirlwind your life is, you've forgotten about who you serve. And Jesus, being Jesus, in verse 16, rocked them. Jesus replied, they do not know, need to go away. And I probably believe before the next sentence, they're going, all right, what are you going to do? He said, no, you feed them. You feed them. I've equipped you for this moment. You feed them. This was a response of verse 17. But... I'm I'm adding that word to it because that's what we would say. But we only have here five loaves of bread and two fish. How many loaves do they have? How many loaves do they have? Fish? Five and two, right? That's all they got. Five loaves and two. That's all they got. But in verse 18, everything changed because they took that five and two and Jesus said, bring them here to me. You see, when we take our problems, when we take our circumstances to Jesus, everything changes. 
The world was about to change for a whole lot of people because the disciples were freaked out and they didn't know what to do. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I get freaked out and I don't know what to do. And all I have to do is bring it to Jesus. Just speak the words, Jesus to it. If you can't remember scripture, if you can't remember anything else, just speak Jesus to it and watch what he'll do. Bring them here to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over. Don't miss that. Not only were they satisfied, there was leftovers. That was like us yesterday. Right, guys? Not only were everybody satisfied, we had 32 pounds of bacon. You know what happened this morning? The kids finished it. I bet they're satisfied. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So not only do we need to be where the people are, we've got to be willing to minister to their needs. The disciples did not want to meet the needs of the people, but Jesus said, you have no choice. Let me give you the tools. But they freaked out because they only had how many loaves and how many fish? But that's a lot when Jesus is in the house. I can't help but to wonder. They've got their basket, right? Put, put your elementary school thinking cap on for a minute. You're one of the 12. Jesus has just challenged you to do something great. He's given you a basket to hand out this food. I just wonder, did the level of fish and bread ever go down? Did it stay up? I don't know. Maybe it's where your faith was. Maybe if you have great faith, it went down, but you know it was going to come back up. Or maybe if you had little faith, it stayed up top the whole time. But the whole point, as long as they kept reaching in the basket that Jesus gave them, there was food there to give away to people. So as long as you keep reaching into your basket that Jesus gave you, guess what? You're going to have what you need. Everything that you need is going to be right there because Jesus gave it to you. Jesus changes everything. So 5,000 men plus women and children, probably 20,000 plus people were fed with what? Five loaves, two fish. That's a Jesus story. To be a missional church, we've got to be about the king's business. We've got to make sure that we don't find ourselves in the place where the church of Ephesus was. Worship team, come on. It's so easy to come in and check boxes. It's so easy to get caught up into, because see, a lot of you are like me. My wife and I have been here almost a year now, and if you don't watch it, you get caught up into what, the way we used to do it, the way we did it where we used to worship. It's not about that. Jesus called you out of that for a reason, so don't bring the reason with you. He's called you to set you free. And this morning, he has challenged you. The great thing about these lights, I can see you, but I can't see you well. Or maybe because it's not bad outside, I'm not sure. Uh, but the whole point being is, I pray the Holy Spirit has challenged you this morning to get involved. But not just at Hope Church. There's great ministry. Cookville is a blessed community. I mean, our leadership, you, you, you look at the leadership of our, 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 our commission, our city council, our, our sheriff, all these different things. And are they flawed? Yeah, they're flawed. But they're believers. All these different ministries that they're, they're out there that are doing great things, get involved. But you know where your first responsibility is? Right here. God has called you to do great things right here. At Hope Church. That's why you're there. Not for the glory of Hope Church, but for the glory of God in Hope Church. So what are you doing for the kingdom? What difference are you making? I want to lay one more thing at you. At the very end, at the very end of that story of the feeding of 5,000, it goes into Jesus walking on the water. And we know that Peter's the one that had the 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 gumption to say, hey, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come here. You think his brakes went on when Jesus said, all right, come on. I, I bet they did. I bet his brakes really went on. 
How many of you have said, Lord, if you really want me to do that, make Shelton play this certain song? Seriously, do we not do that? Lord, let me wake up at 6.07 in the morning without an alarm clock, if you really want me to do that. Make that table levitate. Y'all would have freaked out if that thing would have took off, wouldn't you? Man, we should have thought of that. But that's what we do. And Jesus said, come on. What did Peter do? He came on. I know it's terrible English, but that's what I came up with. So can you imagine? He's at the edge of that boat, and he takes that step. I'm not going to jump off. But he takes that first step. That's a doozy. All that stuff in that water that could eat him. But he stepped out. And for a few moments, he was fine, right? Because his eyes were on Jesus. Scripture says that the wind and the waves were tarry. I think he was probably wondering if it was me. Let me put it in our terms real quick. Mike, I want you to do this. All right, Jesus, I'm ready to go. Well, come on. So I start to step out. And then I finally step out and I get a little bit, you know, you get a little bit jello legs because it's not the world that you thought it was going to be and things weren't so, so nice when you got out there and people are talking about me. People are pointing fingers at me. People are, 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 are gossiping and all that kind of stuff. Do you serve them or do you serve him? So I step out and I'm thinking, hey, I'm walking on water. Is Shelton watching me walk on water? I, I wonder if that's what was going on in Peter's life a little bit. Was he thinking about the other guys in the boat? Was he thinking about, are they watching what I'm doing? And so Peter starts to sink, right? And he drowns and that's the end of Peter. <laughs> no, that's not the end of Peter. What's Jesus do? Peter, get up. Go back to that baptism moment a minute ago, being submerged. Everything, think about what Peter was thinking about when he's going under that water. But Jesus pulled him out. Everything that was over Peter's head was under the feet of Christ. Everything. If you get nothing else out of today, get this. Everything right now that's over your head is under the feet of Jesus. Everything. So what has God called you to do that you're running from? Could today be the day that you said, you know what, I'm done running. Now I'm running to the altar. I'm ready to give it up. Father, I pray that in this moment, first of all, that you would be glorified. Lord, I know that we say we don't want to be that church of Ephesus. We don't want to be in that situation where we're just checking boxes. But Father, today you've given us that opportunity to say, I no longer want to check boxes. I want to be about you. So Father, I pray that you just pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and give us the courage to take that step. That sometimes that step may look like it's 200, 300 yards long to the front. Well, I don't have to go to the front. No, you don't have to go to the front. But there's power up here because other people will pray with you. So Father, I pray that right now that you would be glorified in this moment. Lord, and we would finish what you've called us to do. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's worship. You know, when you sing something, you proclaim it. Lord, I'll give you all. He's counting on that. I pray that today that you've been challenged, maybe to think back about some things that you promised God. It's been brought back to your mind, that you'll do something with it. Or maybe today's the first time you've been challenged with that specific thing God's given you. Or maybe you're the one in the room that's like, man, if they'll just get done singing this song, I can get out of here and nobody will know. Well, they're going to sing just a little bit more. I'm going to pray most of you out and you can by all means leave this room. But if you want to stay in and worship for a few more minutes, feel free. If you want to respond to that call that God's going to your life, feel free. Prayer teams are waiting for you. Pastoral staff's waiting for you. Whatever you need, we're here for you. No, we don't have all the answers, but we know who does. So, Father, thank you so much. We thank you for the opportunity to be challenged. Well, I pray that, and we, and gosh, we, we, we're so blessed to be in a church, so we get challenged every single day. Father, maybe today's the day we decide, you know what? I'm going to do something about it. Today's the day I'm going to step out of the boat. 
For some of you, not even in a boat. Today's the day that you get in the boat. But Father, I just pray that as we continue to worship you, Lord, bless those that, that, that leave now and go somewhere else. I pray that they would go and impact the world they're about to step into. But for those that need to stay in worship, Father, we pray that you would be in our midst. Lord, we're going to lay this time at the foot of your cross and ask you to have your way. We ask all this in Christ's mighty and holy name. Amen.